Good morning, everybody, and welcome to service for Woodburn United Methodist Church. I'm really glad that you're here this morning with us. Uh, make sure to take a few moments and greet those in the chat if you're watching this live, down in the comments, or uh, just enjoy the fact that we are able to gather together and worship God even as we are separated. So thank you very much for coming, uh, and let's join together in the call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. We come here to learn to be witnesses. Although we did not walk with Jesus in Galilee, we come here to learn to be witnesses. Although we were not chosen by lot among the disciples, we come here to learn to be witnesses. It is enough that we heard the story from others. It is enough that we have been given the choice. With trembling hearts, we come here to learn to be witnesses. If you'll join with me now in the prayer of invocation, which comes to us from our Jesuit uh, brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, I am your humble servant. I come before you today in need of hope. I need hope for a calm and joyful future. I need hope for love and kindness. I pray for peace and safety. Some say that the sky is at its darkest just before the light. I pray that this is true, for today seems stormy and dim. I need your light, Lord, in every way. I pray to be filled with your light. Help me walk in your light and live my life in faith and service. In your name I pray. Amen.
when my strength is failing the end This morning's reading is Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened, that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us, that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey, everybody. So this will be um, a different prayer time than normal. Uh, we do have a number of uh, needs that I would like you to make sure that you lift up throughout the week. Um, Chuck and Patty's daughter-in-law uh, needs uh, 
some heart surgery and that that will go well. Uh, continue to lift up Vicky as they figure out what is going on on her liver. Uh, be with Jocelyn's friend Linda who uh, lost her son Jacob. Uh, Kathy Williams and her health as well. Um, but to, to be honest, um, if you are someone who does not like either men or your pastor to be emotional, this is probably a good time to tune out for prayer because um, it's just about 20 minutes ago, we got, uh, we got news that some of our dearest friends... Uh, their, their young son has been diagnosed with a really, uh, really aggressive form of cancer. So I'm just going to pray the only prayer that I have right now. And it's the Lord's Prayer, but it's going to be a lot different than you're used to. But this is how I pray when I need it. And I need it. So you can pray along with me if you want. Pater Himon, our Father. Pater Emu, my Father. Han Tois Thuranois, the one in the heavens, the one who is watching, the one who is with me. Hagiaste Tota Anamasu, may your name be seen as holy. May it be venerated. May it have power. El Theto He Basileasu. Bring your kingdom. Bring your kingdom in those who are sick. Bring your kingdom in me. Bring your kingdom, my friend's son. Kinotheto Thatata Lemasu. May your will become. May your will become reality, become truth. May your desire for peace and healing become reality that we live. Hosanuno kaepikes. As in heaven, let it be on earth, as perfectly followed here as it is there. Tanartan Hemon Tan Epiosi and Dase Min Samaran. Give us our bread today that we need for today. Keep me from focusing on the future and failing to live for now, failing to trust you for now. Keep my gaze where I can make a difference. Kaya face. Amen ta mata hemun. Forgive us where we have failed. Forgive us where we have failed to love, where we have failed to live up to your commands, to live up to your will, where we have failed to be your children, where we have neglected people, and we have neglected to care. In the same way that we forgive those who mess up with us. Lord, give us a compassionate heart to forgive those who have hurt us. So that's the yardstick that you will use with us. And do not carry us into temptation. Alrusai ape tu poneru. Instead, carry us away from evil. Carry my friend's young son away from this evil. Carry those who are sick in this congregation away from evil. Bring them to life 
with you and with those who love them. Amen. Well, I wrote this song this week, and it's uh, kind of about what's going on in our world. And, you know, I believe there are certainly things that we need to be careful of. And, but I also very much believe that Jesus doesn't want us to live in fear. And so I wrote this song, and I, maybe you will feel the same, maybe you won't. Uh, but anyway, I would love to share it with you. I haven't got it memorized yet, so I'm hoping this will stay down. <laughs> I've got the clothespin trick going, Judy. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to give it a try anyway. I think I've got it. <clears throat> it's called New Home in the Sky. Stay wondering what this world is coming to Worried if you step outside You'll get the CV flu Do you ask your friends and family If they've had their second shot May I gently remind you Of what you've already got Cause our sweet Jesus told us We should never be afraid Always trust in him and the promises he made And it won't be Trump or Biden that will lead us when we die We'll be with our Lord and Savior in our new home in the sky When you turn on the news, does it make you get depressed? Do you mutter to yourself, oh, this world is such a mess? Believe me, I'm not saying there's no challenges to face. All I'm saying is remember God's amazing grace. And our sweet Jesus told us we should never be afraid. Always trust in him and the promises he made. It won't be Trump or Biden that will lead us when we die. We'll be with our Lord and Savior in our new home in the sky. As I look around, I see the signs of spring. All wonderful reminders of what Easter Sunday brings. It breaks my heart to think about what we put Jesus through. When he died upon the cross, he said, I do this for you. And our sweet Jesus told us we should never be afraid. Always trust in him and the promises he made. And it won't be Trump or Biden that will lead us when we die. Be with our Lord and Savior in our new home in the sky. We'll be with our Lord and Savior in our new home in the sky. I have been loving the weather this week. Clear skies and perfect. It reminds me of how when we were in Albany, we lived very close to the airport and we would often have numerous small planes flying around above our house on beautiful weather like this week. But as soon as the weather turned even a little bit, they would all scurry back to the runway, running away from the clouds. I always thought it was something to do with the planes, but Mel explains it better. I started flying in 1956 when I was 18 years old. <laughs> I've gone all the way from Piper Cubs to DC-3s, F-4Us, and also I'm helicopter rider too. <laughs> Most small airplanes do not have a complete instrument panel for IFR, or for flying instruments. If the aircraft is set up for flying instruments, you have an artificial horizon, you have a turn of bank indicator, and if you make a coordinated turn, the low ball on the bottom stays in the center, and you have a needle that goes right or left, depending on which way you're turning, and it indicates how fast you're turning. Then you have an altimeter, and then you also have a rate of climb and descent, which shows 
how fast you're climbing or how fast you're going down. Mm -hmm. And uh, you rely on those for flying instruments. They, when, they, when they start out teaching you to fly uh, instruments, the instructor pilot will take you up. You're under the hood where all you can see is uh, inside the airplane. And he'll put the aircraft in various maneuvers with your, and you have your head tucked down and eyes closed. And he's okay, you've got it. And so then you're supposed to come up and right the airplane where you're straight and level uh, and have it under control. However, your middle ear or inner ear has three little loops in it. And they will get fouled up. And you will think, even though the instruments say you're flying straight and level, your body feels like you are in a turn or a descent. The thing is, when you get this vertical of your, unless you have a long distance between the time you break out to the ground level, uh, you're gonna crash. I had originally read an article that was published in Aviation Magazine in the 1970s. And it seemed like that they took an average of pilots uh, that were VFR, visual flight rules only rated, and did a test on how long it took for them to lose control of the aircraft. And the average time, of, as I remember, was less than two minutes. However, there was one done in uh, the 1990s, and they took 20 pilots and put them through this uh, situation where they induced vertigo. The, the one, the, the, the one that lost the first was 20 seconds. One of them actually went for eight minutes, and to me, eight minutes in a, a situation of vertigo would be intolerable. If you're not instrument rated you're not gonna last long. And I had an uh, example that happened, I'd had numerous hours of flying time. And I was going into Portland one time, was, at this time I was flying with the National Guard. And the other pilot with me was, I was flying left seat and he's flying right seat. And he was an airline pilot with a lot of flying time. And but anyway, they, they brought us in too close to the airport and they brought us in and we did a 180 to come back and do an ILS approach into Portland. The minimum for an ILS approach is half a mile visibility and 200 feet. And a half a mile of visibility is not a, not a lot. And at 200 feet, uh, you go down pretty fast. Anyway, I got vertigo, and now you've been flying at this time for probably 10, 15 years. And I was laying halfway across the cockpit because of just staying on the instruments. But most, most times you get enough experience so you, you don't get run into that problem. But I had flown numerous times since then and before that where I never ran into that problem. It just happens that we're, the thing that causes it are violent maneuvers or our steep maneuvers coming into a situation. And the thing that really gets people, they do not believe what they're seeing. If this is a case where I relate it to dealing with my creator. I trust my creator and you've got to trust your instruments. You, you, don't, you don't trust your, your sensations. You, you have to trust what, what you've been taught and, and, and have learned. Those, those instruments are, uh, do a much better job. They're more trustworthy than your mind or your, or your, or your body feelings. Wow. Without instruments to follow or training in using them, a pilot caught in poor weather or with vertigo will not survive even 10 minutes, usually less than two. Losing our bearings can really be destructive. I, I see that a lot in people's lives too. I, everyone has times when the way forward is foggy and clouded, when they suddenly can't see bearings that they have built their life around. Maybe it's the loss of a spouse or child, retirement taking away the career, loss of mobility or identity. Heck, I know people who were thrown into a tailspin because Biden got elected. And I know others who lost their faith because Trump got elected before him. Big or small, when our bearings get obscured, it is like the entire world fogs up, clouds over, and what seems right often can crash us into a cliff, so to speak. The scripture passage for today could also be a good example of that. 
The disciples saw Jesus die. Their hopes were dashed. The man they had placed their hopes and dreams upon, the man they had followed for years and had been ready to fight and die for, was himself dead. Nothing in their world made sense anymore. Some women came back from the tomb saying his body wasn't there, but uh, that couldn't have made much more sense than Jesus being dead in the first place. I mean, resurrection doesn't really fit in most people's understanding of daily life, today or then. It was like a thick fog had rolled in on their lives, obscuring everything they had been using to navigate life with. Some of the disciples stayed put, uncertain of what to do, but at least two of them bolted out of town. We don't know why they ran, but they ran. They were uh, talking about Jesus still on the way, but they weren't doing it with any hope. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, one of them said. Had hoped, but not anymore. They were in the fog and couldn't see their way out. And the move that made the most sense to them, disoriented in that fog, was heading home, running. Fortunately, Jesus met them on the way before they crashed. He walked them through the scriptures, reasoned out what they meant, how they had been interpreted through time. And the disciples listened, apparently eagerly, and invited Jesus to stay with them in town. And as soon as Jesus broke bread with them, the clouds lifted and they finally saw the sun. That action that they had seen so many times in the past suddenly clued them into the reality that they were actually experiencing. This wasn't just some random stranger. I mean, this was Jesus. Like He was alive and they were running. They had been crashing and they didn't even realize it. Immediately, the two disciples picked up and headed back to Jerusalem that same night. This year has been incredibly disorienting for many people. Routines broken, reformed, and broken again. Progress made, and then progress immediately lost. Businesses, churches, even family gatherings shut down. Political upheaval, you name it. So many of the things that we often use as landmarks to guide us have disappeared in the fog. And maybe you're doing fine. <laughs> Excellent. Way to go. But maybe you're hurting right now. Confused and don't really know which way is up anymore. Maybe over the year you've just steadily become more and more disoriented. Until you don't really know what's going on. There's a real danger in that, just as in flying, because our feelings, our emotions in the moment of confusion can often lead us straight into a cliff rather than out safely to the other side. Doubts are not the problem, not with me and certainly not with God. Confusion is not the problem. What we do with those doubts and troubles, confusion and frustration, that's, that's what matters. What we do when we're in the fog matters. It is literally life-saving, but it's hard. Trust your instruments. After several thousand years of working out how to fly straight when everything is fog, four big guides have been found. In Methodism, we call them the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. I'm sure you've heard of them before. Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. And those are the same things that reoriented the disciples. Jesus taught them scriptures, reasoned out what those meant, how the tradition had been expecting them, and it was their own experience of knowing Jesus breaking bread that brought it all home. When I look into the future right now, I see a lot of fog on this pandemic, on racism, on political divisions, on, quite frankly, most things. Even as we return, a lot has changed that we will never, sometimes even should never get back. I don't know what is on the other side of that fog and I don't know how thick it is. I know that is scary to a lot of people, me included some days. But I would say this, 
Trust your instruments and hang on. The fog ends. So what are my instruments telling me? Well, Scripture tells me that God is still love even in our times of brokenness and confusion and pain. Tradition tells me that there have been times like this before, many of them, and they have often been catalysts for something amazing to be born, especially in the church. Reason tells me that big changes come from many small actions. In my experience, my experience of this last year reminds me that church is more than a building. Far, far more. My instruments say God is at work even in the fog. Do I know where all the time? No. Do I feel it all the time? No. But contrary to popular American culture today, our feelings can easily mislead us in the moment. They can lead to despair like the disciples were feeling when they should have been elated. They can lead to apathy like... I'll admit I have succumbed to at times this year when it seemed like nothing was making sense or moving forward. They can, like a pilot, lead us to crash in record time when we are in the fog and experiencing vertigo of the soul. When my emotions are all over the place, my instruments stay steady and read the same thing. They read, show love. When all else is confusion, show love. When the way seems vague, find ways to show love. The fog will clear, but until it does, we cannot cut and run and hope that Jesus will hunt us down and find us. We cannot lose course. Trust your instruments. Show love.
So announcements today. So um, there are a couple of announcements. First of all, of course, is yes, we are continuing to have our uh, nine o'clock meetings. So if you are not participating in Sunday Zoom Forum, uh, you're quite frankly missing out. And the book that we're going over at Thursday is quite good. And I don't know about the rest of those who attend, but I at least have been truly enjoying the conversations and the depth uh, that we can have on Tuesday mornings with Study With Pastor. And all of those are available at nine o'clock in the morning, uh, Sunday Forum, Tuesday Study With Pastor, Thursday Book Group. If you uh, do not feel comfortable using Zoom or you don't know how to, please give me a call. I'd be glad to walk you through it. You can call the church office, email me. Uh, all of my contact information is on the church website, woodburnumc.org. So I, bl oh, <laughs> I forgot the other two <laughs> announcements. So of course, uh, we are planning on returning to in-person worship soon. However, do not worry if online is how you have been communicating we are, uh, and participating we are, uh, and you do not feel you are able to return in person for one reason or another. We are doing our very best to make sure that you will not be left out of the picture here, okay? That as we return to in person, there will still be a place for an online presence, an online community, and that is not going to be abandoned either. Okay, so don't don't feel like this is an ending for you if you can only participate online. All right, we love you. We're glad that you're here, and we want to make sure you can still be a part. But we also want to return to in person in some form for those who haven't been able to make it here on online with the rest of us. And it's been a year since they've been able to meet, and that's important too. Uh, so right now we're aiming for Pentecost is kind of what we're aiming, but cases have been rising rather precipitously this last week as schools have reopened, um, more uh, transitional seasonal labor has come, and um, more transitional seasonal workers have come, and the more people move about, the more likely you are to contract or spread uh, COVID. So cases are going to rise the more people circulate. People are going on vacation more and uh, like I said, schools being back in, more jobs and businesses being open and cases are going up. So we are trusting that with the rise of um, vaccinations that the case count will still be uh, down by the time Pentecost comes and we'll be able to have it. So we're uh, still planning on that and heading toward that, so mark it on your calendars and be prepared for that. Uh, final announcement is that I will be going on vacation for this, uh, this next week. So starting basically by the end of this video, <laughs> I will uh, be on vacation for the week. So I'm going to be doing some, some hiking and hopefully some camping, uh, go to the beach, work in the woods, build things with my hand, do yard work, and read a book. <gasps> I know, right? So anyway, I'll be taking off for, for the week. If it's an emergency, feel free to give me a call. But otherwise, I'll be just kind of checked out for a little while and enjoying uh, some time off before we ramp up to meeting in person. And I believe that is all the announcements that I have for the week. So if you will take this benediction with you as we close. May you go in the grace and love of our Lord Jesus. May you find your way through the fog. May you stay true to the instruments that God has provided. And may you come out of the other side and see the glorious risen sun. Go in peace. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.
If you will join with me now in the prayer of invocation, which comes to us from the, from a magic chipmunk in the Himalayas. No, where does it? Oh, come on, Brian. A, a band of roving gorilla squirrels. I 